got some art, beautiful artifacts back there that, that have some history connected with them. All I knew was that it belonged to someone and Peter Gibbert and it was his army drum. And uh, at the time, my now ex-wife, when I took it home, said, you're not bringing that thing into the house. <laughs> and it took a while to uh, find uh, the time to start looking into it and restoring it. And as I did and discovered what Peter Gibbert had done in 1913, it was it astounding because I traveled back and forth to Gettysburg a number of times. And uh, to think that this old man, 70 years of age, managed to hike 200 miles over four mountains uh, with a drum and, and all was pretty astounding. And uh, anyhow, uh, this young fellow back here, uh, Ray Conroy Zimmerman, portrayed John Conroy, who marched with Peter Gibbert. And I have to stand up. On May 26, this year, as Peter Gibbert had done 100 years earlier to the hour. Uh, we, in, in the past couple of years, we managed to find uh, markers along the way to know what he did, where he was, for pretty much of the trip. And that was a matter of searching out the old Lincoln Highway. And we believe that we did that and we found the markers. And I could not have done it without uh, Conway here to pull me along and push me and things like that. Uh, over the mountains in four days or six days of rain. But anyhow, one of the things that we did uh, as we marched, uh, we marked the road every every night when we stopped with the road paint and dated it and all. Then the next day came back to the same spot and put a fresh date on it and stepped off. But every time we encountered the colors of the national level, whether it was in town at the city hall or flying on someone's front porch, we stopped, beat to the colors from the 1862 protocol, rendered arms, and marched on. And at various times, uh, people uh, joined us. Uh, veterans came out to their front porch and joined us and had, wanted to have pictures taken. Uh, they saluted with us. Uh, young children in, in schools, uh, in Everett, there were there was a troop of Boy Scouts who wanted to join us on the edge of town. Uh, on the west end of the town. Uh, it was raining. And they joined us. They wanted to march for a couple of blocks. Well, three miles later, they were all in step, counting cadence and soaked to the bone as we were, and uh, we said our goodbyes. Uh, later, in Everett, uh, we, uh, or in, uh, in Greasewood, uh, we passed to the, uh, the Greasewood Elementary School, small school with 97 kids. They all came out carrying flags as we came along, so we marched with them around the school several times and rendered honors. And I'd like to do that right now. We need to start the program officially by rendering honors and perhaps with the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, if you'll all stand, please, attention to colors.
Another one is um, John Proctor. Before there was a church on this site, the local Presbyterians gathered on the corner of John Proctor to worship. And once, uh, it, I'm sorry, Proctor had been a part of Forbes Army that came through this area during the French and Indian War. And as a matter of fact, a portion of Forbes Road it is right outside the doors to the chapel on the other side of the Iran Iron Fence. When the county was formed, John Proctor became the first sheriff of Westmoreland County. And when the American Revolution began, Proctor raised the first battalion of militia from Westmoreland County. And in 1973, the Italian flag bearing John Proctor's initials became the official flag of Westmoreland County. It's the, the flag hanging at the back of the chapel, the saying, don't tread on me. Now, there is a much more extensive history of the church and the chapel in a pamphlet on the table in the back of the room. But our purpose today is to honor those 145 Union veterans, and we do have one Confederate in Berea Unity, but the 145 Union, Union veterans who enlisted during the Civil War and went off to preserve the, the Union. Before we start the program, I am going to ask, it came to my attention that there are a number of you who are here because you have ancestors among the Civil War veterans buried here at Unity. If you do have an ancestor among those veterans, would you please stand? And by the way, I'm one of them. My great-great-grandfather is buried here. So, uh, wow.
today to Kennedy Chapel. Uh, as Mary Lou said, Kennedy Chapel has been one of the churches of the Presbyterian congregation here in the Great Latrobe area uh, beginning in 1774. This is the third of the three uh, chapels that you sit in today. And so we are thankful that you're here and we do welcome you warmly uh, for this, uh, this program. Uh, Lisa asked me to share a, a thought or two uh, as part of a memorial meditation. I was thinking about the fact that we would together be doing the Battle Hymn of the Republic, which of course is a very well-known uh, hymn, if you will, that represents uh, some of the chapters of our nation um, at war. I, I thought, that, though, because we are celebrating the 150th anniversary of the Gettysburg Address, because we are remembering the Civil War today, I was reminded of uh, another well-known song. I may be pushing the season just a bit, but probably not, not too much. Back in 1864, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, uh, a poet that I'm sure we all remember at least from high school and maybe junior high school, but he was uh, living at that particular time in 1861, when the Civil War began, there was a, uh, uh, a missile uh, bomb that was fired, uh, and his wife uh, was killed by that uh, early attack, one of the early attacks of the Civil War. And as time went on, within a year or so, his eldest son was pressed into service, and on Christmas Day in 1864, he was feeling particularly depressed about the state of the world, most especially when he heard the church bells begin to peal on that Christmas day in 1864, and he wrote a poem called Christmas Bells. We know it better as I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carol play. Now when he wrote that, we were still months away from the end of the Civil War. The war had dragged on for some four years. The terrible toll that was taken in human life and in all of the other aspects of the Civil War were still very much in the very forefront and people were at that point in time desperately praying for peace. He wrote these words that I'd like to share with you. He wrote, I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. In the midst of that civil war, in the midst of the, the loss that was still going on, it struck him strange to sing about peace on earth and goodwill to men. In fact, a little later on in the carol, he wrote these other stanzas. Then from each black accursed mouth, the cannon thundered in the south, and with the sound, the carols drowned of peace on earth, goodwill to men. It was a difficult time for the country. It was a very difficult time for him. His son also was grievously wounded during the course of the war, but he was not killed. He did survive. And yet in the midst of all of that, in the midst of all that was going on, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow remembered that even in the midst of war, even in the midst of darkness, even in the midst of death, that God will prevail. That in the midst of everything, God is our refuge and our strength. He said in the second to last stanza, In despair I bowed my head, there is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, good will to men. And I remember, as a pastor now, I remember the times that I stand at the grave of veterans. As I stand there with a the family who is grieving, as I stand there with other veterans who have come to pay their respect, I am always reminded that in that moment we talk about God and country. We talk about God and country. 
And today we sang the national hymn. And we reflected again upon the goodness and the providence of God in the midst of everything, the way in which our God is our God. And in the midst of everything, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was able to conclude his carol, his poem, by saying this, Then peal the bells more loud and deep, God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. At this point in our gathering together, our remarkable band is going to play the vacant chair. If you note on the back of your insert, uh, there is a little bit of information there about the vacant chair. You'll note it's writing in, again, uh, the midst of the Civil War. As they play it, might be good for us to meditate a bit on the words that are set forth there.
10 days from now, and 150 years ago, President Lincoln was asked to come to the site of the Gettysburg Battle and make some small remarks. Please join me in reciting responsibly those remarks. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure.
five of them carry the total weight of the action in the war. For example, initially when the president called for volunteers after the firing on Fort Sumter, Pennsylvania provided 25 infantry regiments. They signed up for 100 days, 90 days, 100 days. To tell you the truth, they never fired any shot, and then they went home. Only two of those signed up again and served for, I'm going to say, the largest part of the war. In addition, some 30, 33 units enlisted in the fall of 1862 for nine months. They <clears throat> served their time into the spring and the summer of 1863, and then they went home. Not a good situation. But at the time of the war, it became obvious to individuals and young men that it was no party signing up and serving in the war. So they were only able to find individuals who would say, well, I'll give you nine months or more. Why do we say all this? Because the 53rd was organized in October of 1861. They then followed, they then proceeded from uh, Harrisburg to Washington, and they arrived there in November of 1861. From that point, they served in the U.S. Army for the entire war. They were one of only a few who served for the whole war. Now, uh, the 53rd was composed of 10 companies. They were organized from individual counties throughout the state. It, the interest of us is as follows. Company K came from this area of Westmoreland well, County. Uh, who were these men? They were all patriotic volunteers. They were primarily young men who felt that they should stand up for their country. In the Civil War, the average infantry regiment contained, at the outset, 952,000 men. By the time they proceeded and joined an army, they were down to seven or 800 uh, right away. What happened to those men, the other men? They couldn't even carry out and execute the march. They physically were not up to it. They became ill, they were sent to the rear, and ultimately sent home. Within a year, <clears throat> that 1,000 is down to 400. By the time they're in action and they see battles, it's down to 200, 250, at the most 300. So, in the Civil War, what did the 53rd do? It was assigned to the 1st Division, 2nd Army Corps of the Army of the Potomac. Its initial action was in the Peninsula Campaign on the outskirts of the, of the Confederate capital of Richmond in the spring of 1862. The unit saw uh, heavy action on the 1st of June at a battle called Fair Oaks Seven Pines at that action. They sustained 94 casualties, in, including the regimental major was killed. Following this, at the end of June, going into the beginning of July, they were engaged at seven, seven days battles outside the capital, in which they lost 28 men. But at the same time, during this period, they sustained a very high number of illnesses from Typhoid, typhoid fever, illnesses from the water, food that they, uh, the landscape contained a number of, uh, a number of, uh, of uh, swampy areas and all of the exposures to uh, mosquitoes and that sort of thing. 
following, uh, following the defeat of the Union Army at Seven Days, ultimately the Union Army and the Second Corps and, and, and the 53rd then was pulled out and brought back to the Capitol in Washington, D.C. The next primary action was at the Battle of Antietam, in which they were part of the elements that that broke through uh, the Confederate line at, at the Sunken Road. I don't know if you know about the battle. If you've been to Antietam, the Confederate had a line there. The Union was able to break the line. It was in the center of the Confederate position. The casualties there were only 25 of them, so the regiment was well uh, handled at the time. After the Battle of Antietam, the Union Army Commander General George McClellan was cashiered, I suppose, to the best part by the President and the Secretary of War, uh, Stanton. He was not aggressive enough, and the Union was looking to get something done. So, uh, McClellan was replaced with a general named Ambrose Burnside. You wonder about his name? Yes. He had long hair here, and that's the reason that they now call him Cybers. <laughs> now, he advanced in December into central Virginia, arriving <clears throat> opposite the town of Fredericksburg on the Rappahannock River. The problem was General Burnside forgot to bring something to get the troops across the river. So they sat there and waited while they brought boats and bridges, pontoons, really the term. Meanwhile, General Lee, of the opposing officer of the Confederate side, had, had all the time he needed to organize a stout defense on the <coughs> southern side of the river. After the boats arrived, the Union were able to get across, occupy the town of Fredericksburg. General Burnside decided that he wanted to, att to attack the Confederates on the heights south of the town, overlooking the town. They first tried an action on the left-hand side. That did not go well. It was not well organized and uh, supported. But, the, but then he decided to attack them right up the town, up, up a slope called Mary's Heights. And the 53rd and the 1st Division, 2nd Corps, and the entire 2nd Corps took part in this assault. Now, what occurred that day was very, very sad. You have the town, and the houses of the town the streets, and then there's a rise, and it rises up, crosses the canal, and rises up to the crest of the heights, in which the Confederates posted our total. About a third of the way down the slope, there was a sunken road, and on the downhill side of the road, there was a stone wall about shoulder high, and the Confederates then had posted infantry there. So anybody charging up this slope first would be fired upon by a cannon, and then as they got close to the wall, all of a sudden musket fire that they couldn't even see. It was like they were <coughs> all of a sudden there they were. After seven attempts and the loss of 7,000 men, Ed Burnside called it off. A very sad day for the Army of the Potomac. The cost of the 53rd that day was 155 men out of 314 engaged, nearly one half. The story is that the 53rd advanced to within 60 yards of the wall and then held a position maintaining the fire, exchanging with the Confederate infantry behind the wall, not an even scenario. I happened to see a set of diaries that Mary Lou had, and one of the soldiers in the unit who was ill at the time wrote home and said that he had learned from the fellow soldiers in the unit that the boys were very badly used at Fredericksburg. It was an impression that stayed upon them for a long time. 
because eight months later at the Battle of Gettysburg, elements of the Second Corps were positioned down Cemetery Ridge on the 3rd of July, and they repulsed Pickett's charge. When they successfully repulsed this charge, the, the soldiers who had been in the Second Corps and had experienced Fredericksburg at that time stood up and shouted at the Confederates, Fredericksburg, Fredericksburg, and otherwise, we got even just now. After, after Fredericksburg, Burnside was, he would lead, and the army was placed under the command of Joseph Hooker. Now, I think most of the adults here, <laughs> And uh, the one thing that some people keep in mind with this general was is he liked to keep at his tent ladies of the evening, and they were called after his name, and that name has continued to this day, and that is the origin of that name, <coughs> sadly or so. Um, for getting back to the war, he was not a very good general. He had real good ideas, and execution was well. When it came to crunch time, he couldn't follow through. And the Confederate officers had known him prior to war knew that when he played poker, when they would play cards, and when it came, came time to call him in, he would always back down. And they knew this about him. But the one thing he did after the disaster at Fredericksburg, the Union Army then returned to camps, camps, wooden uh, huts that they had, and they stayed there through the winter of 62, 63. It was a miserable time. A lot of men became ill and died. When General uh, Hooker took over, the first thing he knew he had to do was to raise the morale. He brought in better food, fresh fruit and vegetables, something that these men had never had, better water to drink, and he assigned each core a patch that they wore on their shoulders so they would know what their unit was. And the second corps wore an Irish shamrock because one of the brigades in the first division was known as the Irish Brigade. They consisted of volunteers from immigrants from Ireland. Okay, going on. Unfortunately, the next battle was Chancellorsville. The 53rd was slightly engaged. This occurred in May of 1863. They basically covered the retreat. They lost lightly, but it was a disaster. Hooker did not resolve his men. It was General Lee's greatest victory. They outsmarted uh, Hooker, and when the time came for the crunch, he backed down. After Chancellorsville, Lee invaded Pennsylvania, culminating in the Battle of Gettysburg. The 53rd was there, the 1st Division, with the Second Corps arrived early on this early on the second day, July 2nd. They were posted on the Union on the left of the Second Corps line at the Southern Nana Cemetery Ridge. That was okay for a while. On their left, the Third Corps arrived and they were posted on there on the First Division's left. The Third Corps was exposed to the extent from Cemetery Ridge down to Little Round Top. Unfortunately, in the early afternoon, the commander of the Third Corps, a, a New York City politician, was an aggressive man, Daniel Stickles, who up, in, up until this time, his most uh, famous event in life was, he had shot the son of Francis Scott Key over an argument concerning the fact that the deceased had had an affair with his wife. Sickles got off. He was able to hire some excellent attorneys. He got off on pleading insanity from whatever. And subsequently he gets rewarded and he's a general in the Union Army. Well, he doesn't like his position that he's been assigned because the low point close to the ground is low there. And he looks out in front about 800,000 yards and the ground's higher along Ginsburg Road. So he takes his whole core out there and post it sticking out alone with both flanks in the air and the and the second corps first division now has no one on the left and out to the left front is the third corps 
Little did they know that the Confederates had formed a line further extending to the left, and it was under the command of James Longstreet. And at 4 o'clock, he assaults, and the Third Corps gets clobbered. Part of the line is anchored in an age topographic and landscape feature at Gettysburg known as the Wheat Field. The Third Corps starts screaming for help, and the whole First Division of the Second Corps is rushed to the Wheat Field, including the 53rd. At that time, they had, in action, 215 men. However, three of the companies were serving in in that division uh, provost guard, so they didn't see uh, the degree of action as the, hundred, as the other 135. But anyway, the 1st Division rushes in, stabilizes the Union line. The 53rd sustains 80 casualties. The battle there was so intense, uh, in the division there were, there were four, four infantry brigades, two Excuse me, two of the commanders were killed. Another, including uh, the commander of the 53rd's brigade, was wounded. By the way, that commander was Colonel John Brook, who, was, who had been the initial commander of the 53rd. After the Battle of Gettysburg, the regiment sought action in the fall at Bristo Station, Mine Run, uh, they sustained like casualties there. The following spring, Ulysses Grant arrived east to take over the Army of the Potomac <coughs> and see if he could defeat Robert E. Lee. The initial campaign between those two was called the Overland Campaign. It started in May of 1864 and ran for approximately five weeks. It was a very sanguine affair. The battles were Wilderness, Spotsylvania, North Anna, and Cold Harbor. The 53rd and 1st Division were lightly engaged at the wilderness. They were kept out <coughs> on the left flank, thinking the Confederates might pull something, and they really didn't see that action. However, at Spotsylvania, they saw action on the 8th of May, 10th of May, 12th of May, 18th of May, and 21st of May. On the 12th of May, the Second Corps passed in the early morning hours, and they, had, they had attacked a section of, of the Confederate line and actually overran it. There were entrenchments with attitude out in front, but they succeeded, and they captured almost an entire Confederate division. However, the success was very short lived the Confederates counterattack. Oh, before I continue, the whole time this was happening, it rained. It had rained for the previous two days, it rained the, uh, the entire day of this. It was like a misty rain with a low fog, and you couldn't see more than 10 to 15 yards in front of you. So, uh, the Confederates counterattacked. They were successful because Robert E. Lee himself heard the noise, rode up, had his reserve troops, and he was ready to lead the counterattack against the fellows that are broken through. Uh, the Confederates that were there with him said, no way General Lee to the rear, and they, they an enlisted man from one of the units actually took Lee and his force, took them to the rear, and then they counterattacked, and they, they were successful. They drove the Union forces, including the Second Corps, out of the captured ground. The Union forces jumped over the earthworks, and they were on the outside of the earthworks, while the Confederates got up to the inside of the earthworks. And then they stayed there the rest of the day fighting in that way, with only the earthworks between them. If you rose up and you looked, you were likely dead in a flash. But this went on all day in the rain and the mud. I have seen reports of soldiers say it was the worst day in their lives. At the Battle of Spotsylvania, the 53rd had sustained 177 casualties. It was the largest they had in the war. Over the previous winter, they had received a number of enlistees, recruits, and the strength of the regiment had been built back up to about 400. They 
lost another 69 at Pearl Harbor, and later in the month of June, another 99. For the rest of the war, they participated in the siege of Petersburg, and they were also present at Appomattox. Now, in summary, 1,993 men served in the 53rd. This included conscripts and subsequent enlistments. Of that number, 200 were killed in action, 194 died of disease, and I imagine several of them occurred in Andersonville, and another 587 were wounded. It's an incredible number. You may ask, why am I being asked to talk about this? Because in the room I have to work from, there are 16 individuals in here who served in Company K, including the, the initial commander, a Colonel Coulter, Captain Coulter, and a Lieutenant George C. Anderson, who rose to become the Lieutenant Colonel of the regiment. In my view and others in the society, these men are real heroes. They did their part. Some of them were wounded not just one time, but two times. Um, I don't know uh, uh, how many of you have ever served in war, but once you get wounded, you're not anxious to go back. I want to say one more thing on close. I wear this hat because this hat stands for Civil War Preservation Trust. It is an organization that solicits donations and contributions. They use the money to acquire land that becomes available on existing <coughs> Civil War battlefields to keep it out of falling in the hands of developers. They then donate the land to, to that specific park. Thank you.
it's, it's going to be a little bit of a hike. Uh, I'm also going to have somebody bring my car out a little bit later so that if you do drive and decide that it's just getting to be, or I'm sorry, if you do walk and decide it's getting to be too much, uh, I'll run a, sh a shuttle service to bring you back down to your car. But um, at this point, I want to thank everyone. Uh, Alfred, you did a wonderful job. I'm so Hopefully we'll see some of you.